Okay, um, today in Vention or in Vimtio, um, the, the first five weeks from today on are the categories of rhetoric I'm going to look at in a minute. Invention, I'm calling finding the meaning, arrangement, or organizing your talk. Style, answering the real questions, making sure that the approach you're taking is appropriate to the situation. Memory, how you prepare to present, whether you actually memorize or not. And then delivery, the presentation. On March 12th, the seventh week, we'll talk about the act of preaching and teaching, a little bit more details about the process, the uh, actual event. And then applying the principles or final exam. Any questions about any of that? You all know that you can ask questions anytime as we go along. Uh, we were talking previously about uh, these three. The first couple of slides in every class are always what we did last week. Homiletics, this class is called Communications and Homiletics. I think you know what communications means. Homiletics is the, the application of the general principles of rhetoric to the specific department of public preaching. Or, and this is important because not all of you all see yourselves as preachers, it can be the composition and delivery of a sermon or other religious discourse. It can be a devotional. It can be a, a class or a course. We'll get into that a little bit today. So this is homiletics. It's the discipline of doing the job of communicating the message in a Christian context. Um, we specifically talk about the two great aspects of homiletics. Preaching, the act of delivering religious truth or giving religious and moral instruction or exhortation. And it's important here, for the purpose of touching people's hearts and changing lives. I've talked about the difference in preaching and teaching, which is the next thing. Teaching is the act of providing instruction or direction for the purpose of increasing people's knowledge and understanding. Preaching is aimed at the heart. It touches people's hearts and changes lives by introducing them to the truth of God. Teaching is more cognitive. It's more looking at the brain. We're trying to convey information. Um, some of the great sermons ever have not conveyed any particular information. And I may have used this, did I mention Dr. King's I Had a Dream last week? That's my favorite example of what a sermon, a preaching event is, as opposed to teaching. That sermon prompted, you know, practically a generation of people to get serious about the civil rights needs in our country. And yet, there is no factual content in that. He did not teach them anything. He said, I have a dream of a day when my children are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. There's no facts in that. That's not a cognitive thing. He was touching people's lives and hearts with that truth. That's a good example of what a sermon is as opposed to a teaching event. Okay? Does that make sense? So I have a question for you. If that's what preaching is and teaching, let's talk about it. And I want you to respond to me. Can Christian preaching and teaching be taught or learned, or is it entirely a gift of the Holy Spirit? What's the answer? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it can be learned. I think it's both. Okay. How's it both? Well, I think the, the Spirit, God's Spirit can you know, give you the gift of teaching or preaching, but I think you can get better at it. Yeah, you need to do it well or do it poorly. Yeah, yeah last, last class, Biblical Interpretation, we talked about the fact that the theory of verbal plenary inspiration is the belief that human beings have will and interest and desire and that, you know, the, the authors of Scripture were people and they invested themselves in it, but in a mysterious way, God superintended the process. And he sort of turned that around. God can, can mysteriously and miraculously um, call somebody to preach and give them a gift for it, but they still have the responsibility to put themselves into it, to work at it. Now, this is the passage. <coughs> I'm going to have myself a little bit, because I agree with what Chris said. Um, this is from the Amplified Bible, and the reason I say this is because it actually sort of defines terms here. Um, the Amplified Bible says, So God has appointed some of the church for his own use. First, apostles, which are special messengers, the ones sent out. Second, prophets, and this is why I have the Amplified Bible. They define prophets as inspired preachers and expounders. A prophet isn't somebody who tells the future. A prophet is somebody who speaks God's word. It's, in most cases, it's what we would call a preacher. Uh, that's the prophetic voice, is the preaching, is the hearing God's word and being called to, to give it to other people, to preach it, to teach it. And so that's why I use this. Third, teachers, then wonder workers, uh, then those with the ability to heal the sick, helpers, administrators, speakers, and other unknown tongues. So this passage, 1 Corinthians 12, talking about the gifts of the Spirit, 
says that both preaching, or what he calls prophets, and teaching, that's the second and third kind of big category of people that God miraculously gifts to do that task. And so that's the question. That's why there's a question. Some, some people would insist, you can't teach preaching. You can't, you can't get somebody. Well, you can't give somebody the call of God to be a preacher or a teacher if God hasn't called them, because we're talking about a special kind of teaching here. We're going to talk about Christian teaching. But um, you can make them better at it. You can give them the skills to be more effective at it. You can help them do a better job of utilizing the gift God has given them. Um, to me, that seems very simple. Uh, and we have to ask the question, when it comes to preaching and teaching, what's the difference in a gift and a skill? Somebody can be given a God's gift for something, but it may be that in order to be the best kind of servant God wants you to be, He may want you to work at it and gain a skill. Skill is an accumulation of developed ability in something, as opposed to a gift, which is just given. Skill takes time. Marvin? Well, I think any, any craft, any art, any enterprise, you can learn it, you can work at it, and if God chooses the gift, to give you the gift of being special or whatever. A simple example for me is I go to the office on Saturday morning, so it's hardly ever anybody there, but I'm there, <laughs> and if somebody does come, I'm ready to take advantage of the situation. Yeah. You know, if, uh, if I don't bother going in, and somebody comes to that. Yeah. I think it was Woody Allen. Yeah, I hate to quote Woody Allen, but anyway, uh, Woody Allen said 90% of it's just showing up. Yeah. <laughs> and to some extent, that's true. God can give somebody the gift of preaching, but he also gives them the ability to decide, I'm just not going to do that. I'm going to stay home. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to show up to those preaching opportunities. Um, and a lot of that is in our control. Somebody says, well, you know, nobody has asked me to preach. Nobody, you know, nobody, nobody's given me the opportunity to teach. Nobody gave me the opportunity to, to start a theological institute. <laughs> you know, we just did it because we saw that it was needed. A lot of it is, it's amazing how often if somebody who has some ability, you know, you, if, you, if you offer to do something and the first thing they learn is that you really suck at it, then you may not be asked to do it twice. But... But if you, if you feel like God has called you to something and you've worked to develop the skill, you can create opportunities. You know, it just takes a little bit of a loose spot to do that. But um, we do have to work at it. We have to develop the skill. We have to learn how to do it well, even if God has called us to it. Um, someone has said that a preacher will not long hold the interest of his people if he preaches only out of the fullness of his heart and the emptiness of his head. If you don't do the work, if you don't do the study, if you don't know the stuff, if you don't work to, you know, and prayerfully seek God's guidance to give insights to people and, and, and work the text and, and all of that, then it doesn't much matter whether you think you're called to it or not. That's like um, when I was in England for the C.S. Lewis conference, they had a, a singer one night. Uh, he's sort of a, a folk singer, extraordinary guitarist, and a lot of what he does is cause oriented. He's a Christian. And I completely, Martin Lloyd, uh, I think it's in T Y M A R T Y N, Martin, I think his name is Martin Lloyd. Um, and brilliant musician, I mean, extraordinary. Um, and he's talking about Christian music, and he said, um, People say, well, this is Christian music, and that's not Christian music. It's, he said, if it's beautiful, if it's, if it's beautiful in the way that's honoring to God, it's all Christian music. He said, it's like going up to a beautiful tree and saying, are you a Christian tree? <laughs> um, he said that too often, people will say things to him like, well, God gave me this song. He said, and then they sing it, and I realize why God wanted to get rid of it. <laughs> there is still, even though you feel a call of God, there's still a qualitative issue if you're going to communicate effectively. Now, God doesn't do miraculous things, but we got to do our homework, too. we got to do our part of it, and that's a big part of what we're, we're talking about today. Okay? Um, so, rhetoric. I'm outlining this course according to the classical principles of rhetoric, or the principles of classical rhetoric, which is the use of language, which my definition is language, logic plus grammar. You think logically about things, you think well about them, and then you apply them to language, uh, to, to grammar, to the structure of our uh, process of communicating, and you get language, to instruct and persuade a listener or reader. Now, we talked last week about invention is the first step, what you want or need to say, then arrangement, 
how you structure and organize your message, style, by what approach can you best communicate this message to this audience, memory, how can you be best prepared to effectively deliver this message, and then delivery, in the most practical terms, how can I best present this message at the actual moment, all right? Those are the five, we're gonna deal with those. Today we wanna to focus on the first one, which is invention, evaluating your purpose and developing your argument or message. What do you want or need to say, and why do you need to say it? This first one, invention or inventio in the Latin, since most of this comes from Latin uh, scholarship, was, is the process you begin to form and develop your effective argument or your effective presentation. Any sermon or any teaching is an argument. And argument is not a negative thing. I remember when I was teaching logic last term in philosophical theology, and I said, you know, here's how you develop an argument. And some, somebody said, oh, I don't think we should be arguing. <laughs> well, an argument just means a logical presentation of premises that draw, from which you draw a conclusion. It doesn't mean you're mad at anybody. So any sermon in that way is an argument because you are presenting premises and conclusions that you want them to accept. And so it is an argument in that regard. So um, inventio is the process of forming and developing an effective argument in the form of a sermon or a lesson or a devotion or whatever. Um, it's the first step and it begins with generating ideas that can create that argument that's convincing and compelling to others, that you can persuade them um, that Jesus is the Son of God and they need to commit their lives to Him. So we are persuaded, Scripture says. Um, so that's what invention, inventio, is all about. That's what we're talking about today. And I want to start out in that discussion by saying the most important thing, the most important thing, after prayer, all of this is, you know, I, I hope I don't always have to qualify things by by saying this is done in prayer and in submission to God and just asking His guidance. But the most important thing in preparing a talk, as in all of life, is paying attention. The greatest failing of humanity is not paying attention to anything. Um, scripture says that. That if people are paying attention to the glory of His creation, they will see the magnificence of God in that. People who don't pay attention to other people they miss what their needs are, they miss the cues, the relational cues, they don't communicate correctly or well because they're not paying attention. And attention is something that can be taught. One of the quotes from your book that I really like, this is William Ward, I have no idea who William Ward is, he just quoted out you know, here, uh, 1828. Perhaps there is no property in which men, and women I would add, are more distinguished from each other than in the various degrees in which they possess the faculty of observation. The great herd of mankind pass their lives in listless inattention and indifference to what is going on around them, while those who are destined to distinction have a lynx-eyed diligence uh, that, will, that nothing can escape. If you are going to be an effective communicator, teacher, preacher, lecturer, public speaker, whatever, you have to learn to pay attention. You have to pay attention to your audience and who they are, you know, what, what the context is that you're in, what their needs are, how they're responding to things you're doing, um, how you need to adjust as you go along. You, but more than anything else, you need to pay attention in the world. Um, and part of what that means is you need to be interested in stuff. Um, I, I am constantly shocked at people who just don't seem to pay attention to anything because they don't really find anything interesting. I find everything interesting. You know, I, if, if I had the opportunity, I would sit at my desk and be and online looking up stuff all day long, just because I want to find out more about it. All right? I'll hear a reference to somebody's name, like William Wirt. I didn't have time, but I want to look up and find out who that guy was. I'll look up a name. I'll look up an, an event. I will, you know, look up the etymology of a word. And, and I'm not telling you to be like me. I'm saying that if you want to be effective, in any kind of ministry or communication, you need to be interesting. And the only way to be interesting is to be interested. Last week, I said that a, a boring preacher or teacher is a bored preacher or teacher. That's another way of saying that if you're going to be interesting, then you have to be interested. And that's, that's a process of just deciding, I'm, gonna, I'm not just going to drink beer and watch the football, you know, as many football games as I can get on cable. 
you do other things. That you get excited about other things and interested in other things. <clears throat> and you notice everything. Um, and that means reading. If, if you don't know how to read, I mean, by that I mean no, if you don't have that as a regular part of your life, a regular discipline in your life, then you need to learn how. You can learn things. You can learn to do things differently. I had a friend once and he was a great guy. He was actually the husband of a, of a friend. Um, and I met him and he's just a great guy. But he said, I went in his apartment and he had no books. There were no books in the house. And I said, where are your books? And he goes, oh, I don't really have any books. And I said, why not? He said, I can't read. He said, every time I sit down to read, I fall asleep. And, I, and my first reaction was, you need to get that checked, you know, um, or try to read something different. Find something. You really have to be reading, and that means reading pretty much everything. You have to be interested. And again, that doesn't mean you're going to go home today because I told you this, and all of a sudden you're going to find everything interesting, and you're going to read all this stuff. But the point is you need to discipline yourself and set it aside. It, is, it used to be a fairly widely assumed belief that anybody involved in any kind of communication, especially preachers, should read at least four hours a day, five days a week. That you ought to be consuming information and, and uh, just learning all kinds of different kinds of stuff. Um, Lester Harnish, many, many years ago, said that a minister should have a library that costs as much as the car he drives. I think that's been true for us for a long time. <laughs> Although most of the books we get now, given our geography and the convenience of it, we get on the Kindle. They're a lot less expensive. But um, the reason why, you all know, do you know Kindles? I mean, you have Kindles or you know what they are. Well, Kindle has a new thing called Kindle Unlimited, where you can, for $9.99 a month, you can borrow as many books as you want, but you can only borrow two at a time. And Carolyn and I, when I read that, I said, well, that's not going to work. You know, I've got, I've got 10 books open on my Kindle at any time, any given time. So that when I go back to them and tap them, they open to where I was last time. Now, a lot of those are books that I use for study, but not just study. There's, there's all kinds of stuff. You need to develop the discipline of being interested in stuff if you're going to be interesting and you're going to be a good communicator. And that involves paying attention to stuff. Uh, Carolyn and I have a game we play every night. Uh, we watch TV. So for me, television in the evenings is how my, how my brain unplugs. And I used to beat myself up about it, and I don't anymore because I still seem to get things done. So I'm not going you know, to criticize myself. And that is how I, well, physically, that's when I sit down, but also that's how my mind. But we have this thing, I mean, we, we like TV shows we like watch, like Castle, you know, or in, say, yes, Los Angeles or whatever. The game is, by watching the show, how soon can we figure out who it is? And, you know, who the bad guy is. And it's mostly an exercise in observation. Now, sometimes it's because of something they said or something that happened, but sometimes it's like, okay, that character, I know that actor and, or actress, and they shouldn't be in that smaller role unless there's something else going on that they're bigger than that. And, and I'll, we'll sit there, and usually I'll see somebody, and within three seconds I go, bad guy. <laughs> You know, and usually right, because Carolyn and I have learned to pay attention. And again, please don't misunderstand, I'm not touting that as being, as being, your goal is to be like me or her. But uh, people say to me quite often, how can you do lectures and all these classes and everything? It's because I'm consuming this stuff all the time because I find it just fascinating. And you can too. Okay? And that's a big part of what it means to become an effective teacher or preacher is get interested in everything, right? And when we say everything, pay attention first and foremost to Scripture. The Bible is the great inexhaustible reservoir of Christian truth. A preacher who, there was a cartoon <coughs> of a minister, and he's sitting at his desk, and he's sitting with his head in his hands, and he's got a wall full of books behind him. And, and the caption is, I just can't find anything to preach about. Well, the first place you look is in the Word of God. The Word of God, Scripture, should itself be the primary commentary, and you know the, that's the reason why in every Bible, pretty much, that anybody has that center column in your Bible, you, you may not know what that's for. Those are the cross references for almost every verse in the Bible. They'll have two or three or four or five other verses in the Bible that refer to the same thing. 
So you can just open almost any Bible, usually it's in the center column, sometimes it's elsewhere, and read a verse, and then go to two or three or four or ten verses that will tell you more about it, and start to just, well, I wonder why he says that. I wonder who he was or she was. I wonder why they would do something like that. Um, you start just reading it and paying attention to it, and all of a sudden all these questions come up. <clears throat> you get interested in it, and all of this stuff starts falling in your lap. Okay. So the first thing is scripture. Um, and the vast majority of people <clears throat> do not read scripture daily. Several of you were in the class last hour uh, where I talked about, I almost all of you, um, I talked about the fact that people who say, you know, when I needed God, I went to him, he wasn't there, uh, he didn't help me. And God says, well, you never showed up you never came to me, you never opened the word, you never, you know, you never prayed, you never came to me. Why did you insist? Why do you think that I should always show up when you want me, but you never care to develop a relationship with me? Which the primary way to do that is in the Bible. In God's word to us to study that. Later. My comment when I hear people say things like that, and they say it to me, it seems to me all too often, is um, God's there. God's always there. Mm -hmm. But you know how to hear him, to feel him, to experience him, to, to find um, a bigger source for him. And of course, they look at you and throw up their arms and walk away. You know, there's yeah. another goofball. The problem's not on his end, it's on our end. Yeah, of course. exactly. And one of the ways you can address that is by getting into scripture. Yes? I just wanted to ask because situations have happened where I have non believers and their child gets sick or their spouse gets sick and they go, well, if he was such a great God, why would he allow, you know, my daughter or whatever to get sick? Yeah. And of course it's, as you said here, where I said, well, you didn't care about it before, but is there a way to take it from that point on to bring them in at that, at that point, to draw them in more? I think there is. Um that, that's the real uh, way to address that issue is the question of why is there suffering at all? Why is there evil at all? Um, and I'm not going to get into that right now. You can ask the question. We will address that in the apologetics class later on in the course. And then later on in my series of sermons, if you're coming on Sundays, I'm doing a series now called Why We Believe. And one of those, uh, one of the later ones, so it'll be six weeks from now or something, I'll be preaching on why we believe evil does not disprove God. Uh, the existence of evil and suffering. I think we do need to have an answer for that because the, the question of how is there evil and suffering when there is a God who's supposed to be all powerful and all loving is, a, is the biggest challenge people really make to Christianity. And there is a good answer. Um, there are good answers. It's not one answer. I'm not going to get into that right now. I hope that's okay. Uh, but yeah, or we can talk about it. But it's, it's a, you know, there are ways to approach that in, in order to, you know, basically to say it's not God's fault. Don't blame them for it. You know, um, so, but scripture, the idea that um, we get into the word and we actually spend time in it. Now that means both studying the scope of it, again we talked about this in biblical interpretation in the last class, that we understand the scope of, of what's in the Bible, how it's broken up Old Testament, New Testament, the various books, but we also understand the story. You know, from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation, the Bible makes... There, there is a story that's told, and there are all sorts of different characters and high points and events in there, and we need to understand that basic structure in order to understand where any particular thing we're studying fits in. And um, I think the, the approach, uh, it should have started out in, in the book for this week. Did you all, what did you think of the book? And did you have any questions about it? What did you think of the diagramming process he's telling you to go through? That's a lot of work, right? Yeah, it is. And, and yet, um, the problem is, that I think the reason why most people who want to, want to study Scripture and want to teach Scripture need something exactly like that, and why he even says, don't skip this exercise, even though it seems difficult and it seems a little tedious sometimes, because that's, that is a way to force yourself by the structure of it to actually do the process of looking at what it really says, what are the words, how do they relate to one another, instead of instead of just skipping over it all. Now, somebody who spends, really spends time in the word and understands the context and understands the background and is familiar with the language, 
and, and understands the concepts behind it, the theological concepts, probably does not need to do that every time. And you may be one of the people that's in that place. It's not likely. But uh, I'll give you an example. When I, was a, when I was in college, I was asked to be TA for a freshman humanities course. And so I taught a section, a se several sections in this humanities course, um, on one on philosophy, one on writing. And the writing course, we wanted people to do a um, one-act play. Very simple, and I gave them the structure for it, and I said, here's how you, you know, here's how you present and develop characters in a one-act play, etc. And that was their assignment. And we were very clear, and while most of them didn't, we're not going to win a Pulitzer or a Nobel or whatever, um, well, some did a fairly decent job. Some of them were kind of funny, like one guy was writing about a couple and they kept calling each other Hun, and he spelled it H-U-N, I'll never forget that. Um, <laughs> so, Hun. Um, <laughs> there was young, one young woman who was a freshman, because this was a freshman course, and she was going to be a theater major. And she wrote this abstract theater of the absurd thing. She didn't follow any of the instructions, she didn't follow any of the rules, and I read this, and I sat down with each student to talk to them about what they'd written and what was strong and what they could do better and all that. Well, I sat down with her, and I went, okay, did you read the instructions? Did you listen to me? And she said, um, well, uh, you know, I could have done what you wanted and, and written this, this boring, simple little one-act thing, but I decided I want to do something creative, and I didn't need to do that. I'm past that, blah, blah, blah. And I said, let me tell you something, sister, this is a hot mess, and you failed this assignment. And if you think that you were past this, then fine, it would have taken, this should have been easy for you. You could have sat down in two hours and accomplished this and shown me that you knew what you were doing and gone on to the next thing. But as it is now, you either make this up or you're getting a failing grade for this section. At a certain point, we can think we got our act completely together, but probably we're not as together as we think. And the same thing is true in the Jewish scripture. The process in this book, and that, that diagramming process is one of the reasons why I selected this book, is it gives you, as tedious as it may feel, a way to really get to what the scripture is saying. Be paying attention to the scripture. Now, try doing this in Greek, which is what I had to do when I was in seminary. You know, you do, you do much more complicated diagramming of, of uh, pericopes, as they're called, or, or discourses. Um, in, in Greek, when you're studying Greek uh, interpretation, then, then he is suggesting. It really isn't that bad, and it is a good way to figure out what they're really saying here. All right? Um, I'm actually going to pass out to you, in a few minutes, a couple of other sheets you can use that will help that process as well. But, I, again, it's tedious, but I think you need to practice what he's teaching you uh, on, on those. Um, and one of the things he says, which I really agree with, a lot of people when they're preparing a, a lesson or a sermon or, you know, that you will be, first thing they do is go to a commentary. Somebody else's statement. You know, you're doing a passage in scripture. First thing you do is go online or whatever and read what somebody else said about it. That's not the right way to do it. And he says that. You should start with the scripture, not what somebody else says about it. In fact, there have been times in my preaching when um, I've, I've had a passage and I'm working on it and I'm going to preach on it and everything else, and then I will read somebody, after I've done work, I'll read somebody else and go, man, that's really good. You know, I really like how he said that or she said that or what they had to say. And so I'll take sections on it. You know, I sometimes have given credit for that. Um, and they always are horrible when I preach it. They fall flat on their face. Because this is not my discovery. I'm just parroting somebody else's stuff. It makes a difference. And so you need, there's nothing wrong with once you have done your own work and you've studied the scripture and you've, you've really gotten into it and you, you have your ideas and you put together your presentation and you pretty much got it, to then go back and see if there's any, anything that commentators might say to help plus, that's the expression we used to use, that you plus your talk, meaning you add a little something better to it, you, you make it a little better, you smooth out a transition or whatever from someone else. But don't start with somebody else's ideas, you know, because that, what is that other than denying the fact that God, the Holy Spirit, could inspire you with the message that people need to hear, okay? 
Um, so, pay attention to Scripture. And this book is intended to help you do exactly that. Pay attention to history. Familiarity with the history of the kingdoms and empires of biblical times will go a long way. I mean, I... Of everything that I teach and the lectures I give and things like that, there's nothing that draws as many comments as the historical stuff that I do. People will invariably come to me and say, you know, I hated history in school. If I had a teacher like you, then I would have loved history. Well, the, re the reason why... Somebody just got a new arm. <laughs> um, that's all right. I'll leave him alone. That's okay. uh, I think somebody blowing the horn. I don't think it's an alarm. Um, I. The reason is because I find this stuff fascinating. You know. Again, I'm interested in it, and so when I talk about it, people find it interesting. The same thing is true, and there's fascinating things to be learned about the history. This morning in biblical interpretation, I went through. I told you that all of Scripture is is a story. It starts with Genesis one and goes through Revelation. Well, in class this morning, I gave them, a, you know, sort of a real quick one, one sheet outline of all the major kind of events in Scripture. Um, and so you can talk about that stuff as history, and people will find it fascinating. Um, and included on that list were the Assyrian destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel, the, the Babylonian destruction of the southern kingdom of, of uh, Judah, the Persian destruction of Babylon. Yes? I have a friend who is, is a minister, uh in Fort House, so he doesn't do a lot of preaching anymore. But he would take a look at the week's headlines, mm -hmm. and he would choose a headline, and he would go back to the scriptures and talk about the scriptures in relation to that headline. And people were just holding their heads because they couldn't believe that the scriptures had something so current uh -huh. in mind, you know? And, well, God is beginning, the middle, the end, the everything, and so that's the scriptures of the word of God. Right. You know? Yeah, and that topical is, you know, that sort of thing where you start with the topic and go to scripture to see what it says, and it, and it can be done very well and very honestly to scripture as long as you're just not proof texting, meaning finding the stuff to make the point you want to make. Um, but I, I've quoted maybe last week here. Um, Karl Barth said, read, read the newspapers. In other words, pay attention to what's going on. <coughs> pay attention, Barth was saying. Read the newspapers and interpret what you read in the newspapers based upon what you find in Scripture. Now, the problem in most of culture today is they read Scripture and they interpret it based upon what they find in the newspaper. Oh, we can't listen to those verses because that's, you know, that's not what we believe as a culture anymore. Okay. Um, that, that won't work. But, yeah. Um, in fact, the history part, I, I found a great quote. It was an elder uh, in the church when somebody, somebody was encouraging the church that they had to look the facts right in the face. This elder said, yes, we must look the facts in the face, but we should not fully understand the facts until we viewed them also from the rear. Which is, means look at history. What, what is in the past that will give us understanding of this? So study history. Pay attention to history. Uh, literature, pay attention to literature other than scripture and history. Biography, poetry, fiction, archaeology, the arts and sciences, all kinds of stuff. Um, it's all good stuff. And maybe the only reason that you don't think you like it or aren't interested in it is because you haven't really tried it or you haven't tried any good versions of it. Read everything. Um, I think it was Erasmus that said, when I, when I get a little money, I spend it on books. If any is left over, then I use it for food and clothing. <laughs> the, the intention behind that is the right one. To be interested in everything. I want to read everything. I want to find out about stuff. Then experience. Preaching at its best is sharing personal experience. Talk about boring preachers. That's when they stand up and they just... Last week I said, don't, don't ever teach or preach. And everything you do is just saying, well, one commentary says, well, you know, our Sunday school materials say, uh, share your experience. Even if it's, what, what did this do for you? What did this do to you? when you experienced it. Or tell stories about your own life. I, 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 you know, I do that probably too much in terms of uh, all the stuff that's gone on. Um, and that's one of the reasons too that travel is a great thing if you can do it, if you can afford it, and if you're capable, you know, physically capable to do it. There's nothing that gains you the kind of experience that being in a different place, a different culture, you know, different kinds of people will give you. And I know not everybody can afford it, and not everybody's physically able to do that. But if you are, that's great. 
the th kind of things that you will experience and be able to share. You know, I get, I can, because of just the last year or so, I can, I've got analogies based upon camels and all kinds of stuff that I would not have had otherwise. Um, and experiences in, with Arabian dress and, you know, and on and on and on. Further, I would say, pay attention using your imagination. The imagination can, is, can be the spark. God gives us imagination. That doesn't mean we just go off on the, you know, uh, the crazy deep end on making stuff up. But there are ways to use the imagination that can make a sermon or a lesson, a teaching, brighter, more um, interesting for people. You can use visualization. What I mean by that is not you know, sitting and sort of visualizing what's happening. But inserting details that can cause somebody to feel much more like they're there. Let them see it as though they're actually there. Now that, that means using very vivid, colorful language. You know, describing, you know, I could say, I rode a camel, or I could say, imagine a being that, and, and start to describe what it smells like, you know, what it looked like, how one camel, it was the, the camel owner told this camel owner, he, or he owned all the camels, he said one of the camels was, he looked sad to me, and one of the, uh, the owner said, he is very sad, he just lost his wife. You know, and he's grieving over the loss of his wife, and to talk about what that looks like, and you know, and what it feels like to get on a camel and have them, you know, almost throw you off first forward and then backwards as they're standing up, and to give the kind of sense of, and I don't know that you're going to use a camel analogy or anything else, but the, the idea of being able to cause people to experience more than just you saying, "Oh, I rode a camel." Um, supposition, the idea of a hypothetical illustration, to be able to say. Imagine that you're on a boat going down the Nile River in the first century, and there are crocodiles on one side, and there's hippopotami on the other side, and, and, and you see off in the distance the, the pyramids, okay? Just suppose you were there, kind of thing. You're not only visualizing, but you're giving a supposition. Um, parables. Jesus taught in parables for a reason. A parable is a story that makes an important moral, ethical, or theological point. And you can use parables today to tell a story that makes a point. Um, I told one this morning. I was talking about the, the it's, a, it's a parable story from uh, D.L. Moody that a woman picked up a book and she started to read it. And she read the first few chapters, didn't like it at all. A few weeks later she met a man and, and ended up, they started dating, they ended up getting married, and she finds out he's the author of that book. She takes up the book, and all of a sudden, the book is terrifically interesting to her. That's a parable, telling a story about something to make a point, that, that maybe, the, maybe getting to know the writer of the book will cause you to love the book, talking about the Bible. Um, but there's a parable. Figures of speech, similes, analogies, metaphors, personification. A simile is something is like something. Uh, an analogy is... Um, a, a suggestion of kind of a pattern of, um, uh, of similarity. You know, the weather in Mexico um, feels like you're living in the most exotic, comfortable place in the world. You know, you, like, like Hawaii without the hula girls or whatever. That's an analogy. Uh, a metaphor. Simile is something is like. Metaphor is something is. The Nile River is the most, is, is the most ancient of women. That's a metaphor. It is. Personification, to, to um, give a personal attribute um, to, to a thing that is not a person, for instance. Um, the, God is a rock. The, the trees will, uh, the fields will clap their hands. The stones will cry out in worship. Uh, those are all personifications. We see a lot of that in Scripture. So you can use your imagination. Pay attention to that. All right? All of that is part of paying attention and thinking about how you can communicate those things. And it involves being interested in stuff. Um, so go home and read everything. <laughs> <laughs> you missed all of you after the carol. All right, so how do you actually do this process? Which inventio means coming up with the, the initial step in developing a sermon, a lesson, a talk. I'm going to give you my kind of direction. After prayer, pray that God will give you direction. The first question I think you need to ask yourself is, what are you being called upon to do? 
Are you being asked to give a sermon, a homily, a meditation? Now, those are all similar to the same things, except that a homily means a, a, a sermon that is in, uh, to expound on a scripture. A homily usually is done in high churches as a way of saying, you know, our, our, our gospel reading that you just heard is from Mark 4, and then to talk about it for a little while. Um, I usually think in terms of homilies, meditations, and sermons as being a meditation is two thirds of a homily, which is two thirds of a sermon, you know, kind of thing. Um, are you asked to give a sermon, a homily, a meditation, a teaching, a devotional, a whole class, a whole course, a lecture, an introduction, a eulogy, a toast, a continuing series of talks, or what? You have to start out with what am I being asked to do, to my mind? Okay? Because preparing a eulogy is very different than preparing a whole course of lectures. Duh. And so you need to be clear on what your task is, what your, what your goal, what your assignment, in effect, is. Now, if you are a minister, a, a regular pastor or preacher, then your assignment's pretty clear. You know, I'm being expected to preach every week. But you still have to then decide, do I do that in terms of series? Am I going to do it expositionally? Am I going to do it topically? You know, how are you going to do that? Um, those words will mean more to you later on. But still, you ask yourself, what am I being called on to do? When I was asked to do a lecture, uh, talk for the Rotary Club because they were having a new Rotary Club starting and I was going to be the keynote speaker at their initial meeting, that's a very different process than if I'm preparing a sermon or if I'm preparing a lecture for a class. Um, so be clear on what, what your goal is, what you're being asked to do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Secondly, for whom are you being asked to do it? Is it a congregation, a Sunday school class, a Bible study group, a community group, a civic club, an academic class, a group of friends, a group of strangers, mourners, wedding guests, or who? Because once you decide what you're doing, your next most important thing is who are you doing it for? Because that will change very differently. Am I going to do the same talk at a wedding that I'm going to do at a memorial service? Not hardly. Am I going to talk the same way to a group of people that I know very, very well as to a group of people I don't know at all well in a very formal setting? Government officials that are meeting and they ask me to come and talk to them? Am I going to prepare the same way, present the same way, have the same message for all of those different kinds of groups? Obviously not. So after you decide what you're being called on to do, who are you being asked to do it for? And be as specific about that as you can. Now again, if you're, if you're a regular minister, you've got, your job is to do a sermon, at least a sermon every week, and it's to the same basic group of people. There may be a few new ones, you know, a few that aren't there that week, but those are the kinds of things you need to decide, and it's not always the same. Third thing is, what do you think they most need to hear? Is it a message that inspires, comforts, challenges, disciples, disciplines, encourages, exhorts, educates, motivates, energizes, or what? If I'm doing a memorial service, my goal is to bring some sense of comfort as well as a sense of purpose, for lack of a better word. You know, how is this that somebody dies? What, how does that fit into the scheme of life in our world here? But primarily it's comfort, to have people feel as though the person who has died is being memorialized and honored in a way that people take some comfort from. Um, if it's, there are some groups that I would be speaking to and what they need to be do is, they need us to be challenged. Or maybe even they need to be disciplined. Alright, I, I prepare a lesson and my goal is to, is to exhort these folks and discipline them and, and straighten them up because they've been messing up. Okay, that's some of the things that we have to do in this kind of job. So what do you think they most need to hear? And we're, in this case, we haven't even gotten to a text yet. We're still sort of, this is all background, and for many people who do this all the time, these first three things happen almost automatically, without even being conscious of them. But I think we do need to be conscious of them, because sometimes we miss one of these things. Um, no questions. You know, Which one do you think are, is missed most often? Is missed? Well, I think probably most often people miss who it is they're talking to. You know, and so they're, you know, they're, Give an example. I knew of a preacher, young man, preaching for a group of senior citizens, and he started a series on the dangers of sexual temptation. 
These people were 70s and 80s. Well, after a couple of days, they sort of took him apart, you know, took him aside and said, you know, we really don't need that. <laughs> Clearly, he was not paying attention to who his audience was. Or he had prepared that for somebody else, is what I think had happened, and he decided to preach it there. But he completely missed the audience. And they're going, <laughs> what that that was still a problem, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I think that's one of the ones. Uh, and, and related to that, first, you know, if you miss who they are, then you're going to miss what they need to hear. That's the one I thought would be the most often missed. Yeah. So, um, so you know, further on that, uh, Ross, what don't they need to hear as a general rule? Like, I'm, I'm thinking of, like, I've known preachers that used used a sermon, and it wasn't to discipline or anything like that, but use it as a weapon against somebody that they didn't, yeah. like something they didn't like from doing. Why? Well, and that's... did it publicly. You know? Yeah, well, if, a sermon that, that if a group is really going in the wrong direction, um, sometimes that's the minister's job. But he right. can do it well or he can do it poorly. You can do anything well or poorly. Or you can um, preach to one person. Well, that's that's what, what it sounds one. like. You've yeah. yeah. got the whole group there, but that's you're preaching true. to the one. Um, That's not fair. And I've, I've, uh, I, for instance, have preached sermons where one person in the congregation has said something, but that I believe was probably either a tendency for amongst other amongst a larger group of people, or could have been. <clears throat> now, but I, would, I preached in a way that was, uh, for instance, I had a guy one time say to me, um, "You know, my money is my money. I worked my whole life to earn it. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna give it to a bunch of people who are not willing to go out and work. This is my money. I'm gonna spend it on me and my family." Well, I preached a sermon from Matthew 25 where Jesus said, you know, as much as you have not done to the least of these, you have not done it to me. Depart from me, you are cursed, and the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons, for I never knew you. Because I knew there were probably other people who wouldn't say that, but were thinking exactly the same thing. Now, I wasn't trying to beat them up, but that was a message they needed to hear. But you're right. There are some people that get vindictive. They get an opportunity to speak, and they get vindictive about it. That's never right. That's never a good idea. Uh, but when you say what they don't need to hear, that's sort of just the same the other side of the same coin of what they do need to hear. If you're, if you're right about what they do need to hear, you're not going to make that other mistake. Okay, Florette? Um, I've noticed that in that there are preachers who will just do the pablum type of, I'm not saying you, but uh, that will do pablum uh, sermons on Sunday and then use the Sunday school as a, a deeper sense of learning, but the same people go to the service so at what point do you move your people from the pablum into a, a sermon that, that has more depth and, and... Yeah, Paul talked about milk and meat. Right. You know, the milk of the gospel for those people who are not yet mature in it and they need the basics mm -hmm. um, versus more advanced kind of things. Um, that, that varies from congregation to congregation. Again, what do they need to hear? If uh, One of the reasons we started this instituto and one of the reasons I started the Bible study is because there was one person in our congregation, and this isn't universal, but it demonstrated to me that there was some of this there. There was one woman in our congregation that I said something about Paul in a sermon, very right when I started here. And she came up to me afterwards and said, so Paul, was he like before the Ten Commandments or after? No, no. And she's been a church person her whole life. And I thought, okay, we got a long way to go. <laughs> and so I recognized that we needed to have a, a much more targeted teaching ministry so that they would have the knowledge about stuff. And again, this is one of the reasons I differentiate between preaching and teaching. Is, and, and right now I'm violating this principle with a series I'm doing because I decided we don't have a formal Sunday school kind of approach for adults or others, and so I needed to get some content in there. And so I'm doing more teaching than preaching in the pulpit right now. But for me... Sunday school and Bible study and those sorts of things, while they can be inspirational, they're mostly to impart knowledge, just like these instituto classes. Okay? Whereas the sermon is supposed to be more uh, calling on people to apply this stuff to their lives so that their lives are changed, so their hearts are moved, so that they have more of an experience of God in their life. So to me, the difference is that preaching, whether it's an immature congregation or a mature congregation, generally speaking, and you're never going to hit everybody exactly right if you've got a group of people, um, but that's to be the, uh, you know, a heart, preach to the heart, life-changing kind of thing, and then have other opportunities where you're dealing with the content of teaching, uh, changing knowledge and stuff. Marvin? 
I was involved in a church that preached a salvation message pretty much every sermon and, and was an altar call and, and I was always troubled because you know ninety nine percent of the people were, were born again Christians and they're not getting any food. Yeah. Well exactly and, and I probably hear too much in the other direction. Um, somebody asked me about that the other day. There are people who come into our body who have never met Jesus. And and they they may enjoy what they hear, they may find it interesting, whatever. At some point, part of our job, part of my job, is to call them, confront them with the reality that what they really need is a personal relationship with God that's found in Jesus Christ. Okay? So I probably am not aware enough week to week as I'm preparing sermons. I, I, I certainly have done that. I probably need to do it more often. Uh, but you're building such a foundation with the authority of the Bible and, and praise to me is of these type of things that at some point we're going to say, well, then this God must want us to be accountable in some way. You know, <laughs> right. you can jump off that because you've got all the foundation. If we, if you try to just preach salvation without any foundation, they go, well, I don't really believe the Bible. Right. And so they haven't got anything to, right. except a, a heart tug. And then if you don't feed them afterwards, they drift away because... Yeah, it's just emotional. Yeah. But I had an Anglican one time, I know, said that, um, that so many of the Protestant denominations entirely focus on bringing them in and they don't think about bringing them up. You know, some church traditions are much more attuned to growing maturity of faith through teaching, etc. Well, I want us to be both. And I, if I, if I err, I tend to err more on the side of the bringing them up. And I probably need to focus more on bringing them in in terms of, oh, like this week, I'm, I'm the sermon is on why we, last week I preached on why we believe in Jesus. You know, that we believe in was real, etc., etc. This week I'm preaching on why we believe in the resurrection. And I, I was, somebody commented to me about um, earlier this week, and I thought, you know, this is probably going to be a good week to do that. So don't stay away because of that. Where at the end I simply say that, you know, the resurrection is our hope, but that hope is only available to us if we claim it, you know, kind of thing. Chris? You, you've commented a couple times about the difference between preaching and teaching and one's imparting knowledge, but isn't sometimes, isn't it that sometimes you, you, you sort of teach and preach together? Mm -hmm. I mean, some preaching is going to be teaching, and then you're going to have a wrap-up that brings the point home, right? I mean, it's right. not so divided. Well, and in fact, uh, that's some of what I just heard Marvin saying, is that too many people who are preachers, they only say, you need your life to change, and your life can change, and they don't give any, any content to sort of build up to that or support that. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't mean by that that preaching doesn't have any content. Again, the, the sermons that I preach that people comment to me on most are where I bring history into it, or I bring, you know, that sort of thing. And that needs to be there for the interest and the content and the context. But at the end of it, after all of that kind of, you know, and there is content, you know, informational content involved, the purpose of the sermon is to call people, you know, to, to affect people's lives, to call them to a change of life. It doesn't mean that other content's there, or we just end up, you know, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. You know, the 97th verse of just as I am, people are ready to sing something else. Okay. Um, I don't complain too much about that, because I got saved on like the 15th verse of just as I am. Um, but, yeah, but the difference is that teaching is, in, is, is at its core almost, now yes, people's lives may be changed by the things that they learn too, but the primary focus, whereas the primary focus of preaching is life change and touching the heart, the primary focus of teaching is an increase of knowledge. It's much more cognitive thing. It's not absolutely exclusive, those circles overlap in a big way, mm -hmm. but I think it's important, the reason I keep mentioning it, it's important when you talk about, you know, what are you being called on to do, preaching a sermon has a, has, I think, at its core, a fundamentally different kind of end result desire than teaching a class. Both critically important. That's why we need to do both. But there is a difference, and we need to be clear on that. And I don't think most preachers today are. I mean, I hear, I, I watch sermons, or I hear sermons from, you know, even megachurch preachers, and I think, he's really giving a class. You know, there's not the... There's not the life change thing. There's not the call to Jesus. And we need to do that sometime. Okay? Um, and so I think there's a not a clear... In fact, they even talk about somebody, instead of being a senior pastor, they often are called the teaching pastor now. 
That's the title that they use in some churches. Stan? Just going back to the first part of what you were teaching, and, and that was about experience, and then you ma mentioned imagination. This might be an odd question, but where do dreams and visions fall in? Well, in terms of presentation, again, we're talking about the context of presentation um, here. I mean, for us to be the leaders who are providing sermons and stuff, I think that dreams and visions, our own dreams and visions, can inspire us. They can motivate us. Sometimes they can scare us in ways that we need to be scared. Um, and from that, we can take, you know, color. And, and um, I had a dream the other night where I was fighting demons. And... Carolyn woke me up because I was shouting at the demons, okay, that they, you know, you will not hide from me because they were trying to disappear. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've been praying about that, and I think that I'm going to, I'm, after the series I'm doing now, at some point I want to preach one or more series on the demonic. And I think I was inspired by that by a dream. So, we've got these things. What are you being called to do? For whom are you being asked to do it? What do you think they most need to hear? Going on from that, the fourth step, I believe, is what generally do you think you should or do you feel called to say to them? And we've said what do they need to hear. Well, you can't tell them everything they need to hear. You have to decide what are you being called to say. What is your focus going to be? And when I say what do you think you should or feel called to, it's because we believe that God has a part in this. You know, God not only gifts us, but then God calls us to give certain messages. You know, I, I, I don't know that I've always been as sensitive in hearing that as I should have been, but I believe that, for the, that generally speaking, when I teach a class or preach a sermon, it's because God has said, this is what I want you to do. And heaven knows he makes up for a lot of my failings in the process, if I'm trying to be honest, if I'm trying to be faithful to him. So um, <coughs> we need to make sure we're being honest with who the audience is and what they need at the same time that we're saying, what do I believe God is having me, is preparing me to say to them? Which is another reason why um, we, we can't be too mechanical about this. That's why I think there's a problem when you know, somebody has a series of sermons that they did for another group that really doesn't fit this group, but they just decide, well, I'm going to preach them anyway, or that lesson or whatever. We really have to say, what does God want me, not somebody else, me, to say to this particular group of people? And that's another reason you don't just go to the commentaries the first thing. You give the God, the Holy Spirit, the opportunity to speak to you about what needs to be said. And you pray about that. And you say, what do I need to say to them? And it may be an exhortation. And it may be something hard for them to hear. Or it may be that they need comfort. Or it may be that they, it be that they need direction. They need inspiration. They need, what, what do they need that I believe God is calling me to provide for them? Um, being honest with who they are and what they need. The next thing is, what text will best communicate or can form the basis of what you need to say? Now, again, I'm taking a particular kind of st starting from zero here. If you're teaching a series of um, classes on the book of Genesis, then you're not going to be going to look for a new text. That's going to be obvious for you. That's going to be in pretty much at the start. But if, if coming the other way in sort of a topical approach. Now, I will do this process, basically this process, maybe not this structure, but this process, when I'm preparing a new series of sermons. But once I feel called to do a series, then, and, and I lay out that series, what are they all going to be, then I don't, I don't have to go chasing for the next text or whatever, unless it's what to put on the bulletin. Um, but what text do I then believe will best communicate or form the basis of what God is calling me to say to this group of people. And I need to do some work there. I need to go to the Bible. I need to look up verses. I need to look at text, you know, the um, topical Bibles if necessary. Quite often, um, and, and the more you learn about Scripture, the more, more this will be true. Quite often, the, the text, or at least my best recollection of the text, will come into my mind. And I will know, for instance, this coming week, I know the passage from Paul where he says, some say that there is no resurrection, but if there's no resurrection, then Christ is not resurrected. And if Christ is not resurrected, then we are to be thinking of all people, I've got some out there. But that, and I know the scripture well enough to know that that's what I'm going to use as the basic text for that sermon, and I'll go on from there. Um, so, but we do need to make sure we're being honest with the text, that we let the text speak, and not just look for a place to debut our latest cool ideas and thoughts. Um, 
in other words, not eisegesis. I've known guys. When I was in seminary, guys who were preaching sermons, they go, oh, I just heard this really great illustration. Now I need to find a Bible text and a, and a sermon topic for it. That's the wrong way to do it. You start with what God is speaking to you with regard to this audience that you're speaking to and what their needs are and what God desires for you to say. And then you go to, but, and, and this happens to me often. I mean, I, I will start out and I'm going to be preaching something and I'll start looking for texts. And I'll find 10 or 12 or 15 different scriptures I could use. And, and I will copy them and paste them onto a Word document and print them out and sit down and look at them. And invariably I'll say, well, that's a very cool text, but to get that to fit what I believe I'm being called to say, I'd really have to kind of twist that. And I won't do that. I will not make a text suggest that a text is saying something to fit my sermon goal when I don't really believe that's what it's saying. That's what I mean when I say, I'll be honest with the text. The text has to speak the truth, not be used as a proof text, as they call it, to be able to say something I wanted to say instead of what it's really saying. Rich? Does scripture memorization play a big part in what you're talking about? It does. In fact, that's something that I need to do more of and that I need to encourage more. Um, Carolyn has been doing some stuff on that. And memorizing scripture has all sorts of benefits. I, um, because I've been doing this for a lot of years, I have this sort of uh, backward, I don't even know what to call it. Um, I know a lot of scripture. But I often don't remember where it, where it is, and I often can't quote it exactly. I can quote it generally, so I know what it's saying, and I know it well enough to be able to find it, but I really should know it more exactly. I should be able to know exactly what it says, and I should be able to find it, you know, be able to quote the, you know, the address, the, the book, chapter, and verse. Um, and so I don't have that the way I should, and, and that, that's critical. One of the reasons why it's critical is because no matter what your situation is, driving down the highway, you know, anywhere you are, wherever you are, you have access to the Word of God in your memory. When you can't open a book or look something up or check it online, um, there you cannot exaggerate the value of that. And again, I know Scripture well enough to be able to have the general stuff, but I'd be much better off if I were more focused on learning it, um, specifically memorizing it, and I need to do. Marvin? Well, if you would just stick with the King James Bible instead of all these other yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, I think, one of the truth, truth truisms. The different interpretations say it different ways, and it's very, very hard to yeah. keep it stuck in your mind. But I was mostly going to say, though, after you've looked at the scripture and you've got your thoughts and you've written them down and, and so on and have an idea, and then you go to the commentaries, do you find sometimes that some of them are kind of like, whoa, you know, uh, that's not what. What I saw. <laughs> well, it, it's very true. And in fact, the biggest challenge for me often is not finding more to say because I thought of something else or because I read a commentary on whatever. It's deciding what I'm not going to say. Um, I, I think I said this last week. So often I'll say to Carolyn, you know, Saturday night, and she'll say, Well, is your sermon ready? And I'll say, Yeah, except I've got like 10 pages. I've got almost twice as much as I. Can use because I, I know the way I prepare my sermons that seven pages is is right. If I've got half again more than that, you know, it's not gonna work. And so I have to go in and decide what's not. And it may not be that it's not that it's, it may not be good, it's that it's not the best. And so I keep what I believe is the best that is most targeted, most focused. Um, when I when I go to a commentary or something like that, and I don't, you know, it's quite often I don't at all. But if I go to a commentary or I, I look up online and I'm reading somebody else's sermon, something that that uh, great preacher Spurgeon or you know or whoever said, it will only be either to give me more understanding whether I actually say it or not. Because one of the problems is a lot of people get up and they say the stuff and they have, you know, it's just on the surface. You know, that the, the words went on the paper and they go through their mouth to these people and there's nothing that sunk in. I want to make sure that I've really spend some time, and that means I read a lot more stuff than I than I will use, or I, I, I write a lot more stuff than I will use. Um, so, but I don't, quite often I won't go to commentaries at all, because I've already got too much. Um, I'm going to do one more thing and then we'll take a break. Um, 
The last one is, what does the text actually say and mean, and what questions do I need to ask to get at that meaning? And that's including the context. In other words, that's where I do the analysis, that's where I do the study. That really is the, the, um, the last of these six points, is what your book has been about in this first 60 pages or so that you've read. Is how do you get at what the text really says and what it really means. And then later on he's going to be developing context and we're going to talk about that. Um, so that's a big part of it. And, and one of the ways you can do this, for instance, I want to say what generally do you think you should or feel called to say to them. My preaching teacher, the best preacher that I ever knew, E.M. E. Watson, uh, he was pre-computer. The way he prepared a sermon was he would sit down with a notepad or if he had a, you know, a chalkboard back then. Um, and he would start, after he prayed about it, and he, he had a sense of who his audience was and where he needed to go, what he needed to say, he would just start writing down thoughts. And it could be a phrase, it could be a word, an idea, um, a piece of scripture he remembered, a character in the Bible that seemed to fit the circumstance, and in no particular order, he would just write them all up there. Or he'd write it on a, on a piece of paper. And then he would start, from that, he would start developing what his you know, text he would start thinking about what the text is, and, and he literally would circle this and draw a line and circle that. This is actually a brainstorming process that they talk about using in business as well, uh, where you dump all this stuff and then you begin to see the organization pieces. That's the way he prepared his sermons. Um, words, words, phrases, loose thoughts, you know, the name of biblical characters, scripture verse fragments, etc. And then from that, he would develop his sermons, and he's the best sermon, he's the best preacher I've ever heard. Okay, let's take a break. We were just talking about the fact that this class overlaps in quite a few ways with the biblical interpretation class this morning, which is good. You know, a repetition helps us understand and learn things. Um, but the I use this for the biblical interpretation process uh, passage class. I don't know if I gave this to you last week or if or not. Um, this is another way to get at the same process. You know, the you ask who wrote this passage and. and uh, who was it addressed to? To whom was it addressed with you got a language? What does the passage say? Are there any words in the passage that need to be examined? What's the immediate context? What is the broader context of the chapter and book? What are the related verses to the passage's subject and how do they affect the understanding of this passage? What is the historical and cultural background? What can I conclude about the passage? Do my conclusions agree or disagree with related passages of scripture and, and, and others who have studied the passage? Um, what have I learned and what must I apply to my life? Number nine, for instance, there are people who read one verse and come up with this whole sort of theological thing and don't bother to look to see that it's not consistent with the, everything else, Pat. The scripture, the Bible should be its own commentator. All right? And so we believe it is a unity. And when somebody takes a verse out of context and tries to create a theology around it that doesn't fit with everything else, that's when you get into problems. So this is basically getting at the same thing as the diagram, um, except you still need to do the diagram. I really, I really want to encourage you to practice that discipline, because it will make you look at what the passage says when you start thinking about, okay, you know, what are these words, how do they relate to the other words, and so where do I put them, and that sort of diagram process, um, I think it's very valuable. But the answer, you're looking for answers to these things. Now, I just passed out to all your chairs, I just passed out. <laughs> um, I handed out to all of you two documents. These are documents which um, we used in the How to Study the Bible class that we were just talking about. Let's start with the one that's portrait size. It says Basic Inductive Bible Study Worksheet. This is, I think this comes from um, Precepts Ministries, and they give permission to photocopy it. Um, this is a process whereby you can take a text of scripture and analyze it. It gets at some of the same things this does. It gets at some of the same things the diagram does. It's not as involved, and that's why I recommend you do the diagram, because that will really make you look at the text and what it says. But this is still valuable. The first step, which is the whole front page, is observe the text. What does it say? Who are the characters in the passage? What happens in the passage? Where does the event take place? When during the biblical narrative does this event occur? In biblical interpretation, I, I went through a sort of a story. And so what they're saying is, where does this fit in that whole story from the start of Genesis to the end of Revelation? And how, you know, how does it fit into that? 
Why did the characters in the story do or say what they did or, uh, or said? That's observe the text. On the back, you then interpret the text. What does it mean? Meaning is something we're going to get into more next week. Uh, summarize the main thing. What questions do you have about the text? Getting into what it's meaning. And then apply the text. How does the text relate to me? What did you learn from, uh, about God, yourself, life from the text? What attitude should you encourage or, uh, or discourage in your life? What should you do differently or better because of this text? This is a real simple, almost too simple. This is much more for personal Bible study. It's less for preparation of presentation. But still, I'm giving you these various samples because they will help you get a clear sense of where you're trying to go with this thing. All right? So that's one. The other one is what I created, um, which I call inductive Bible study chart. And I've got four steps. Select a book or passage. Pray God would direct and teach you. Read the passage through at least twice and pay attention. Remember, that's one of the biggest mistakes people make is they don't pay attention. And then fill out the chart below. The date, passage of scripture, etc. Start, and I actually have um, five steps. First, look at the context for the passage. Uh, using the passage itself and the, and the study Bible, because we were using NIV study Bible, uh, introductory materials, because before every chapter it will tell you the context. Uh, at the start of every chapter, it'll say who wrote it, where were they, who were they writing to, what was their situation. So who wrote it, to whom was it written, who or what was written about, uh, when was it written, when did the events of the book occur. When the events occurred is not always when the book was written. Those are often two different things. Um, from where was the book written, where did the primary events take place. So that's the context, that's the first thing. Second, observation, paying attention. What does the passage actually say? Who are the key characters, the key words, key phrases, key concepts, key actions? And then rewrite the passage in your own words. There you will really get a sense of what does it mean. You can't write it in your own words unless you have a clear sense of what it's saying and what it means. Okay? Flip this over, and it's printed a long way, so it's upside down. That's all right. Um, interpretation. That's the third step. Um, what does the passage mean? You've said what it says, now what does it mean? Why was the book written? You know, not what or who, but why. Why was the book written? What's the purpose? What is the major theme or purpose, the message? What does the author want us to know or understand? What did the author emphasize? Why did the author emphasize the things he did? What is unclear about the meaning of this passage? So there you observe for getting the meaning. Fifth, uh, fourth, sorry, meditation. What does it mean to me? Here's where you start taking it into yourself and, and plugging it into your own life. What struck me most about this passage? What does God seem to be telling me here? How does this passage strengthen, encourage, or convict me? What questions does this raise in my mind? So the first interpretation, you're being fairly objective about it. But then you start letting it come home and say, well, you know, how's this hitting me? And then finally, application. How does this apply to my life? Now, you can do the same thing if you're preparing a sermon, like how... You know, how should this apply to the congregation's life, or the class's life, or the whatever's life? Okay. What has God taught me through this passage? What aspects directly relate to me in my life? How do I need to change based on what I've learned? What does God want me to do differently now? What immediate action should I take? Again, you can, you can turn those toward a larger body and say, for the congregation, you can ask all those same questions. You know, what, what, has God, what is God teaching us through this passage? What relates directly to us and our life here? How do we need to change based on what we've learned? What does God want us to do differently now? And what immediate action should we take? So it can be used in a congregational kind of setting. So here are two more documents, um, well three, count this one, that will sort of help you get into that um, inventio, into really getting into the text, understanding the text, letting the text speak, but being able to uh, begin to apply it to the process of developing a course, a class, uh, a Bible study, a sermon. Any questions about that? Laura? I have a question in the sense that we are accustomed to having uh, male uh, ministers, uh, sort of guide directors, things like that. Right. So how can women be more empowering? We can apply all of these things, but there is a concept in our minds that we're used to the male being at the front. 
Well, um, you're talking about how the congregation can be prompted to accept women in leadership, or no? No. How can women become more um, empowered in okay. giving the sermon? Well, I think um, do all the same things we're talking about, but do it better. Or do it well. Well, when, when I say do it better, I'm actually sort of assuming that's going to be the case because women are inherently, and I'm I'm not trying to be sexist here. I'm actually being complimentary. Women, uh, history tells us women are inherently more sensitive to these things. They're more patient than men are. So many of the attributes that are characteristic of women, in, and I'm, I'm being objective in that, I really am not, um, there, there's no negative, I'm not applying any limitations at all. But men are too prone to be, you know, to go off half-cocked, to, to assume that what I think is what everybody ought to think, to not really take into account well, what is, what are the needs of the people I'm talking to? You know, how can I best communicate in a way that they're going to be receiving it, uh, etc. Um, there are a lot of characteristics that are typically common in women that means they, they often are the best at this. I mentioned that Ian Pat Watson is the best preacher I ever heard. He was my preaching teacher. Mm -hmm. And he was the, the preacher of the largest Presbyterian church in Scotland, which is saying something. The BBC asked him to offer sermons on the air. The BBC doesn't do that unless you're pretty spectacular. The second best preacher I ever heard was a woman named Liz Norquist, and this, that's fine for this to be a, she was one of the students that was a preaching student with me. And I knew men who were in seminary with us who really weren't too sure about, about having women preachers. You know, the thing about women, you know, women should not be over men and all that kind of stuff, which I think there are explanations for that. I knew men who heard, young men who heard Liz preach and said, she can only do that by the power of God. And so therefore she is called to preach. She was really good. She became an associate at Hollywood Presbyterian Church. So I'm quite, I'm quite sincere in saying all the same things that women, I think, have aspects of, typically have aspects of sensitivity and awareness that would make you able to do this better. When I say do it, but do it better, it's because I think that you likely have abilities to do it better than a lot of men. Victoria um, preaches in our church. Yeah, Victoria preaches in our church. At the State of Summit. Congregation. Yeah, and people respond well. If we, right? if we, if we, if we she have. She has a power. Mm -hmm. She has power. Yes, I have. She's a power. And the power is of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm encouraging Victoria all the time. She's taking the Institute of Classes. In fact, she's teaching uh, oh. some of the classes that she's already taken um, to, as she continues to learn and work toward it, uh, I'm encouraging her toward, uh, toward ordination and, and gear moments. Um, Understanding that she comes from a tradition, not only in the Catholic tradition, but also the Protestant tradition that she came out of, where women are not allowed to be ordained. In fact, there's a minister in Guadalajara who, the night that they had Arturo's wake, he berated her because she was teaching and leading ministry here. This was at her husband's funeral that he was about that. Something else I'm going to need to edit out. Thanks. No, don't edit that out. <laughs> that's a fact. I didn't, that's not a value judgment, that's a fact. Okay. Um, so, anyway, I, I hope that helps. Yeah. I think that women should be bold in that, and I think Scripture gives, gives authority for women to take that role, and I think women who do it, many of them like Liz, are clearly called and gifted by God to do it. So. Because I have seen... I'm sorry, I'll just add this, uh, women that, that have gone far, but they have their congregation or women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Beth Moore. Yeah, well, where we came from at University Press, we had women, ordained women in leadership, and, you know, um, I think they were very well received, and, mm -hmm. and I would love for us to have a woman on staff at our church. Yes. Are there particular denominations um, across the denominations that don't allow women? Yes. Mm. Uh, a number of the Pentecostal churches don't. Um, Presbyterian Church of America does not. Mm. And um, in fact, the Presbyterian Church of America split off of the Southern Presbyterians. This is before the Southern and Northern Presbyterians got back together in the early 80s. Uh, the Presbyterian Church of America, when, when the Southern Presbyterians, PCUSA, PCUS, decided that they uh, would ordain women. PCA, or a group of them uh, within PCUSA, US, I keep saying that, PCUS, which was the Southern Presbyterians, 
they are already having some theological problems with some of the interpretation issues out of um, the denomination. When the decision was made to ordain women, that was sort of the last straw, and that caused them to split off. The Presbyterian Church of America right now, uh, Covenant College is their, uh, and Covenant Seminary in St. Louis is their ordaining body. And they are, um, women are not allowed as elders in, or preachers or ordained mm -hmm. ministers. Um, and, and in fact, one of the main reasons why Lakeside Presbyterian Church is an independent Presbyterian Church, meaning the government of Mexico sees us as a denomination. We're registered as an instituto, which for them, that's, that's what a denomination is. We are a church, but we're also a denomination, is because the only alternative we really had in Mexico was to be part of the Presbyterian Church USA was thrown out of Mexico over some theological issues. And the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico was modeled on the PCA. The Presbyterian Church of America missionaries helped create the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico so that the, the constitution of the National Presbyterian Church here is much like the PCA. Um, I haven't actually compared them because my Spanish doesn't allow that, but I'm told they're almost verbatim in places. And so they don't allow women in leadership. So we are not part of that because theologically we don't agree with that. And we have people like, you know, two things. One, we have someone like Victoria, who we feel God has called to ministry. And we also have people like Yermo and others that if that, that they're under our tutelage and teaching, and that involves women in leadership. And at some point, if they were being ordained by the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico, they'd have to reach a point where they either have to lie or people would tell them you can't be ordained here. So that's one of the reasons we but, and there are, there are others as well. Uh, Joan? Yeah, the church that Terry and I attended in Regina, Saskatchewan, before we came down here, didn't allow women to be preaching. And um, I think it was an alliance church. And for some reason, the, the greater organization in charge of the alliance uh, church decided to change the law or rules or whatever and kind of leave it up to each congregation to make the decision. Right. So the elders of our congregation kind of uh, went through the decision-making process, but it had potential to be very divisive for the church, and so they decided to just table the whole thing and, and uh, not open it up to women, not necessarily because it was a right or wrong thing, but just because the church had a couple of years ago faced a, a, a nasty division, and, and they just didn't want it to face another division. I don't know where they are at it now, but yeah, they, they didn't want women to preach either. Yeah, and and there, there could very well be some wisdom in that because Paul said that that if, if a weaker brother, don't do something that will cause a weaker brother to stumble, even though you know it's not wrong. Yeah, I, I understood why they did that. I couldn't really blame them for doing that yeah. because even though I think that allowing women to preach was the right way to go, yeah. there there was no point pushing that right. uh, it to just get take time. into the congregation. Yeah, it, it'll come. Yeah, um, and, and, and that's a difficult one. Uh, but I'm absolutely... 100% mine, so, and I believe there is a biblical uh, authorization for that. Okay, I want to spend the next few minutes, uh, I'm going to give you some quotes, and I, I want us to, I want you to react to these, uh, and, and here, toward the end, and it may not be, it certainly isn't half, but toward the end of each of our talks, uh, or our classes, because this is homiletic and said communications, I want to talk about some of the practical kind of communication things. Uh, last week, I gave you a two, two, one, <laughs> The PowerPoint slides of uh, just things I've learned, you know, where I'm coming from, things that, that I hoped you would benefit from. Well, I want to give you some quotes from some other people now and have you interact with me on this. The first one, by Summer's wife, says, 90% of how well the talk will go is determined before the speaker steps on the platform. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. You don't think so? Why not? Where is he on the you know, person's going to speak about. I'm sorry, what? What if you don't know the topic on what the person's speaking about? So, okay. so 90% yeah. of how well the talk will go is determined before the speaker steps off. Here. I think this is this is taken from the speaker's perspective, not from okay. the audience's perspective. Does okay. that help? Or both, yeah, though. Yeah. If, if the speaker right. isn't prepared, it's yeah. not going to yeah. go well. I, I <laughs> no think, matter. I, I think no what matter. it's saying is how well you prepare. Is the biggest single factor in whether it's going to go up. You know, and that's obvious. If you see somebody get up there, and I've done training for people, and they get up there and they're shuffling their papers, can't find this, can't find that. Right. Uh, you know, of course you're going to think, well, how much preparation is this 
you know, person did. Right. Well, and, and I see, I completely agree with that. And I think we have an obligation. This comes back to the God may gift us, but we still have to do the work. Um, and yet, there are a lot of Christian preachers and teachers who, who see, Scripture says, Paul um, writes, when they bring you before the courts, which he promises they will do at some point, then don't worry about what you are going to say because the Holy Spirit will give you the inspiration for that. Some people, I think, believe that applies to everything you do as a Christian. I don't need to have to do the homework to prepare this lesson. I don't need to have to, you know, really do the work. I'm going to stand in the pulpit, and I've got a basic topic, and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit speak. Well, as I say, you know, speaking from the fullness of your heart and the emptiness of your head, well, not very far. Um, I believe God calls for us to do the work. And yes, God inspires. The Holy Spirit inspires. But as, my, as Ian used to say, um, the Holy Spirit can inspire you in your study during the week just as much as He can in the pulpit when you stand up there. And so, whether or not you really are ready, that you've thought this through, that you know what your message is, that you know where you're going with it, you know who you're talking to, all of those kinds of things that you need to think about, that you've structured it, and we'll get into structure later on in, in other classes, but that you've structured it in such a way that it makes sense, lack of transitions from one thought to the next, from one illustration to the next, is one of the few biggest weaknesses in all communication, um, in writing and in in speaking, and it's very hard to to teach that to people. I, in my role in marketing, um, working with agencies or with clients, people will write something and give it to me, and I'll read it. And I'll go, this is terrible, and they'll go, well, what's wrong? And I'll never say it's terrible. I go, this really needs work or something else. Will and it's very hard to say you don't know how to do a transition from one thought to the next in a way that it flows or makes sense. You know, you 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 set up, you know, you're all set up to make a good point, then you just leave it, you forget it, you go into something else. Those are the kind of things that you have to be able to be prepared and thinking about when you speak and think about in advance when you speak as much as when you're writing something. Um, and people can tell if you did your homework. People can tell if you really have prayed about this and worked at it and thought about it, versus if you just say, well, I'm going to speak by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and hope you do better next week, as the minister said. Okay. Um, so, I think this, this quote is saying, you got, you got to work if you're going to do this. Sure. But, you know, I agree with it, but 90% is a real stretch to me. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chris? I think... I agree with this. I think you have to have that preparation. But I think besides being prepared and knowing, you know, knowing all the technicalities of what you're about to do, when you're when you do know your stuff, that then the Lord's Spirit can actually anoint you. You might even go off from a little of the yeah. text. But I think I think the Spirit's more likely to speak through you when you've done that, as opposed to just getting up there and right. winging it. Yes, exactly right. I think the time when a speaker, preacher, teacher, whatever, can most confidently and most effectively go off script is when he or she is is done their homework so that they're absolutely confident in their script. You know, that you know you got that and you know where you're going and if God, and I, illustrations and stuff, you know, come up all the time when I'm speaking. But... It, it's when I'm prepared and I know where I'm going and I know what I'm doing and something arrives, you know, something comes to me that the Spirit gives me or my own brain comes up with or whatever, I can most confidently and effectively insert that when I know that I've done the work and I know what, that I've got a stable base that that's building on. Okay. Well, here's the second one, and this may scare you. It takes one hour of preparation for each minute of presentation time. Now, yeah, these people, by the way, uh, that I'm quoting here, uh, are all professional speakers. Several of them have won the international public speaking competitions, and, and, and which these days involves like 30,000. What do you think about that, Marvin? I think for a short presentation, a lot, but for a longer presentation, you take less time to prepare. You just um, sort of pour it all out. Actually, Harry Truman used to say, if somebody asks me to speak for an hour, I can prepare in 10 minutes. If they ask yeah. me to speak for half an hour, I have to prepare for an hour. If they ask me to speak for five minutes, I've got to prepare for four hours. Exactly. If they ask me to speak for one minute, 
I'm going to be working on it for two days. <laughs> yeah, because you've got to focus it. Lynn? I'm surprised that the comment is only one hour of preparation because there's so much in the, the word prepare. You know, you have to prepare your body, your mind, and your spirit, and your resources, and all those things, and you let alone know what it is you're going to talk about. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let me give you a point of context, and I'm, I'm saying this so you can think about what it means. Last week, I lectured, taught, and well, preached 10 hours in four days. How long did I have to work to get ready for that? 600 hours? <laughs> now, it probably, that probably isn't too far off because a lot of my preparation is stuff that I've done already, you know, in the past. But, and if you've been doing this for a while, then all the stuff you've done to learn scripture, to study it, to study theology, to know the history and all that, I mean, when I, when I want to make a reference to, you know, how, um, well, Alexander the Great, you know, the effect that, was that he had in terms of Hellenism, I didn't have to go back and spend an hour for every minute I talked about that, because I've talked about that a lot, I've studied that stuff a lot, that's all history. I don't doubt that the time that I spent teaching, preaching and lecturing last week that I did probably have a total of 600 hours in that. So, that, but that, so I think that's fairly accurate, even though you may not all have done it all immediately before that event. But if you don't have that background, then you've got to put in the time. Okay? Make sense? And I believe that's true. Um, Nicholas Beaulieu de Preux, <laughs> won the French competition, really. Uh, what, is well con what is conceived well is expressed clearly. What do you think that means? <laughs> I'm sorry, if it was conceived well, we'd know. <laughs> sorry. The statement very long in his name. There's a gentleman my wife. <laughs> I've, I've read books where you go through 30 pages and you just, I must be out this stupid because I just can't seem to get this. Mm -hmm. And then you pick up another book on the same topic and it's bing, 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 it's like, oh. Yeah. So right. you come to the conclusion that every, not everybody that writes or speaks really understands what they're talking about. Yep. I told you that some, a speaker who is boring <coughs> is most likely bored. Likewise, a speaker who is confusing is almost certainly confused. If they have conceived of it well, if they, and all those things that I told you, what are you being called to do? Who are you being called to do it for? You know, what is it that they need to hear? What do you feel you need to say to them? All of those are steps toward having a very clear conception of what am I doing up here? And if you don't have that, then that's when people wander all over the place and they say the same things five times and they, you know, they go way too long, and they, you know, and on and on. That's when you, that's when you experience those kind of things. The worst kind of preaching, teaching, speaking. Um, and so, what, you, the fruit of what you get is based upon how well you had developed the plan and, and exercised it as you went along, which is why I say in terms of scripture analysis, I recommend that diagramming process, because that will be a way that you know that you, you have a system where you can, accurately understand what scripture is saying so that you can conceive your message from that. Um, I completely agree with that comment. Okay? Speakers who talk about what life has taught them never fail to keep the attention of their listeners. Dale Carnegie. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's right. I think stories, you know, it, is a really good way to go, and it certainly grabs your attention. I wonder sometimes, though, that that when you talk, I mean, I'm a little uncomfortable talking so much about what I've learned or myself or my stories or my life because, for a, I don't consider it all that interesting. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's very true. I just think there's a fine line as to how much you talk about yourself. As opposed to, and I think what he's, to me, what, what Carnegie's saying here is um, what life has taught them. Yeah. Yeah, um, people who try to preach on something that they've never actually experienced, 
Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. Fail. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as Christians, if we're teaching or preaching, we have to be careful about that. That we're not making claims. And sometimes it's real obvious. For instance, if I am speaking to a congregation and saying that we need for you all to give, that giving is a spiritual discipline, it's a spiritual exercise, I darn well better make sure that Carolyn and I are giving. Yeah. Or not only is it not going to be spiritually valid, you know, the Lord might hold me accountable for that, but it's not going to ring true. And that's a lot of it, is if I try to teach or preach or speak on something that I haven't personally experienced myself, then it's not going to ring true. It doesn't mean it's all me, 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 you know. I serve the day is why I like blue better than red. Okay? Hardly. Um, but to be able to... Uh, the, the great witnesses, that we, we've said uh, many times, that evangelism is basically one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Well, involved in that comment is the acknowledgement to other people that you're a beggar and that you found something. And then why, that, why they should... Love it too. And if you think about it, people people do that all the time. I bought this great car. I'm watching this new TV show. You really ought to watch it. I, you know, the the we have a contractor that you just got to use next time you need something, right? Those are people get energetic about the experiences they've had, positive and negative. It's also true that that nothing makes a great story when you've been on vacation other than a failure or a potential failure. You know, it's the problems that you always talk about. Oh yeah, we ran out of gas in the middle of you know, that alternator went out and then you know this hippie came along and you know whatever. Uh, those are the stories you tell. Um, so I think that's where that's going. It's not really me, me, me. It's just to use to, to make sure you've experienced the things that you've talked you're talking about, or as it doesn't ring true. And also to be able to your your best stories, your best analogies, your most enthusiasm is gonna come from what you will, you've experienced yourself. Yeah, familiarity. Yeah, that's back to sort of what you know, I told you that someone's speaking and they said, well, our Sunday school lesson for today says this, and commentary I read said that. And it, well, you're talking about somebody else and something else, and the reason why that doesn't fly is because what do you think? You know, you're, you're the one up there talking. We've never even met that Sunday school material provider. You know, so, last one. Um, Alexander Gregg says, there are three things to aim at in public speaking, preaching, teaching. Okay. First, to get into your subject. That's that interest thing. Then, to get your subject into yourself. And lastly, to get your subject into the heart of your audience. What do you think? Very true. Hmm? Very true. Okay. Your... Oh, sorry. Go I was going to say, the first two are more personal. The third one is passion, mm -hmm. you know, and it should be shown that you're passionate about what you speak in, and how do you inject that into other people. Right. And a lot of it, that's got to do, like, say, with evangelism. Yeah. Just learning, you know, from a Christian perspective. Right. That's true. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry I laughed because I remember as you were saying that when I was on cruise ship, uh, there was a couple that were performers in some of the the locations on the boat, and they were English, and the woman had come and heard me speak, and she said, uh, later she said, I really like uh, your lectures and how you talk. I really love the way your voice goes up and down. <laughs> well, she's a singer. <laughs> she's a singer, that's true. But the thing that I think she was trying to say is, I get excited about this stuff, and so I have a lot of tonal range, and you know, and, and a lot of this kind of stuff. That would not be the case if I... Wasn't it? If I didn't have the subject in me, I got into my subject. Uh, I got into my subject, I had the subject in me, and I get excited about it. Um, and so sometimes I watch videos of myself and I'm doing so much of this kind of stuff that I wonder, you know, if people are front row or afraid I'm going to smack them. Uh, but yeah, they it's. Duck. What's that? <laughs> they can duck. Yeah, the spray zone here. Carolyn, you started to say something ago? Well, I was kind of convicted by that because I think that I, I look at public speaking and I, my, the, my first thought is how do I get my subject into the heart of my audience <laughs> rather than rather than think, you know, how, how in depth do I know this thing? And yeah. so I think that that's, that's a good thing to keep in your And that's, that's back to what I was saying earlier about paying attention and being interested in all kinds of stuff, you know, to really get into your subject. 
Look up everything you can. And my biggest problem is I always have too much. You know, I've got printouts of articles on homiletics and kerygma and semiotics and all kinds of stuff that I have not used in classes and probably won't. But um, it's all, you know, all background. And I really get into that stuff and then I try to study it all and I have it, you know, have it internalized as much as I can. And then because I believe in it, I'm excited about it, I think people need to hear it, whether they always want to hear it or not. And you get enthusiastic about it. But it starts with you yeah. and your subject. Mm -hmm. uh, you? I would, the, the word there for me is heart. Mm -hmm. If your heart has not been changed, how can you change the heart of another person? Right. And that's why uh, we talk about preaching, mm -hmm. you know, is, is to touch the heart. It's to change the life as opposed to, and some of what we do is cognitive, you know. Um, it, but um, even then, we want people to walk out there and go, wow, you know, I'm going to have to spend some time here mm -hmm. thinking about that, working mm -hmm. on that. Later on, we'll get into some more of the specifics of how we do some of the delivery stuff and things like that. Any questions or comments? Thank you all.